All right, people, and on today's menu is episode 34. It is Deadly Driver or Tragic Accident. All right, so before we get into the details of um, episode 34, if you recall from episode 32, we did the fourth episode of the series on A&E called Guilty. No, Accused. Oh, okay. why do I always mess it up? Accused. <laughs> Guilty, Guilty or, or innocent. innocent. All right. And so this is the fifth episode of that series, the 34th episode of this um, podcast, and the third episode of season three of this podcast. So chop it up. Yay. I, I, need to, I do have some um, sound effects, but I didn't put them all in there. All right. So let, before we get there, let's talk about um, what each of us have in our cup. So Denise over there in Virginia Beach, what are you drinking on, kind lady? Well, first and foremost, welcome everyone. And I am drinking on some halfway water with lemon. Mm-hmm. And if you are wondering why we have the same clothes we had on episode two, mm -hmm. it's because we recorded the same day. Same day. We are pushing through. All right. And what is that on your microphone, madam? Oh, actually, we are moving right on up. If you listen to episode two, you heard that now we got money coming in. Episode one of season oh. three. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, we have money coming in, and so hopefully the next thing will be money coming in my check. Mm -hmm. But until then, I have been upgraded with this lovely mic, mm -hmm. and it's been branded with Peeps Creek. On the bracelet. Look at that. Excellent. Good job. Look at you moving up and supporting the organization. Right. I'm just waiting for that money of. to come All in right. my check. And so here, over here in the actual cafe, I am partaking in my mason jar look at that filled with some nice ooh, refreshing ice look at that just look at that look that's at that. actually a nice um view mm. like it's a nice because i have a nice camera yeah dude we i told you we are improving over here I this, see. Is, this is not my laptop out of camera anyway i am drinking on my usual now and that is bourbon with um some sugar-free red bull um, it's really a little bourbon. Oh, and actually, I put some water in there too. So yeah, water, nice. sugar-free Red Bull, um, and some good bourbon. Okay, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the bourbon because we're not been sponsored by them. But Bullet, if you're listening, sponsor us. All right. Okay, now. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this particular episode. Um, and so Denise, you talked. Excuse me. You talked to us about the. <clears throat> You set us up for episode um, 32 um, in regards to the Angel Bumpus case. So let me go ahead and try to set this particular case up um, on A&E. Now, I would tell you that I did not too much particularly care about this episode. I just felt like we could have used um, time, energy, space for something else that was more important. No offense to the people who were involved in the this situation, but I just thought the episode was boring. Um, what do you think about that overall, Denise? Did you like the episode? Um, it didn't impact me as much as episode three and four did okay. from the series, but I, it was okay. Okay. All right. So let, let's, let's go ahead and talk about episode 34, Deadly Driver or tra Tragic Accident. So this is, um, out of the good old state of Texas, where Yano unfortunately- County. You have a senator by the name of Ted Cruz there who you all need to <laughs> dump like today. Okay, moving on. <laughs> and it happened in the county of, is it Yano? Yes. Okay, and that's L-L-A-N-O, Yano mm -hmm. County, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are introduced to a Jason McComb, McCombs. Um, and we also hear about the Rowland family, particularly an 80-year-old man and his son. We don't know how old um, the son Roland is. It's, um, it's Greaves. Roland is the name. Oh, Roland Greaves. Yes. Sorry, my <laughs> notes. I, I just put the first name. Okay, Greaves. Okay. I'm like Roland. What? I know. So we we are introduced to Roland Greaves, who's 80 years old, and his son. We don't know how old the the son is. Mm -hmm. um, these two families um, collide with one another, and I'm using that word because ultimately that's what happened. There is a 
um, tragic accident on Highway um, 71 um, in Texas. Is not I just say that because that's the highway that's introduced um, there. But anyhow, um, we know that um, there is a situation where one of the individuals involved dies. So there is a head-on collision mm -hmm. um, between the two vehicles. Um, the ADO, Mr. Roland Greaves, um, dies on the scene of the crime. Or excuse me, the scene of the accident. Mr. Roland's son, um, at the time, we know he's severely injured. That's all we know. We don't know the extent of those injuries. But we hear this particular episode that he is injured, right? Correct. And then we, are, we see Jason... Jason McCombs, who's also involved in the accident, um, he's injured, um, but he's not to the point where he is dead, of course, A, or he's um, incapacitated in any other manner. I think he went to the hospital for a day, if, if that. Um, and so Mr. McCombs has been charged with um, mass slaughter due to the death of um, Roland Greaves, who's the 80 year old person who died. Um, and he's also been charged with, I forget the other one. What was that, Denise? Two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Aggravated assault with a de deadly weapon. If you heard us talk about it on episode 32, whenever um, folks use the word aggravated with a crime, it means that th there was some circumstance, something involved that, that escalated it up from a different aspect. So if you think about assault and battery, assault and battery is basically touching someone else, right? Um, hitting someone else. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you draw blood. It doesn't necessarily mean that anyone blacks out. It just means that you hit someone. Um, and so because of that, that's a simple salt and battery. Now, if I hit someone and let's say I damage their eye, that could be a aggravated assault and battery. Right. So, um, anyhow, <laughs> um, that means that something happened. There was some circumstance that caused that situation to elevate. And so in this particular case is aggravated. Um, what is it? Aggravated what? It's two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And that deadly weapon would be in this instance, the, the vehicle. OK, mm -hmm. now. All right. So Mr. McCombs has been charged with manslaughter and two counts of deadly assault with a deadly weapon, the vehicle being that. And so we are in a situation and unfortunately, we're in a situation where the two surviving members from the two vehicles that collide can't tell you what happened mm -mm, on that day. They don't remember at all. One um, individual doesn't remember. Now, I don't, I'm not sure I necessarily believe him, but we'll talk about that. That's Mr. McCombs, uh, who's been charged, a defendant, um, doesn't remember what happened. And then the surviving individual, and I'm just going to give a disclaimer or a spoiler alert which we don't find out in the episode until almost at the end mm -hmm. of the episode, he's in a vegetative state. So obviously he can't communicate to um, police officers, to any of the individuals involved with trying to investigate what happened. He can't communicate what happened because he's in a vegetative state. Right? As a result of the accident. As a result of the accident. So we, we find that out towards the end of um, the episode and we'll tell you how that happens. All right. So, Go ahead, Denise. I've been talking a little bit. So tell us um, a little bit about how what, what happens. We meet the lawyer, Mr. McCombs lawyer, and talk us a little bit through that. Yeah. So, again, it's a head on collision. He's being accused of crossing the double yellow lines going mm -hmm. into the lane of where Mr. Roland and Perry were coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say this attorney, I do want to mention his name, Austin Shell, because I felt he did an awesome job. Oh, he was fantastic. I yes. mean, when you talk about investigation in comparison to episode 32, what we're talking about, yep. you're talking about someone who's trying to understand the facts of the case, understand where my client fits into this, understand how to try to tell my client's story. <laughs> yeah, he, he did. He did really good. Um, so it, the, the episode starts with a 911 call, a bystander who mentions that there's an accident and it's very ugly. And so the 911 caller asks, are there fatalities? Is that how you pronounce it? Yep. So he says, you know, yeah. Um, and so apparently in, in, when the head on collision occurred, the grease vehicle actually stays in the road on the road. Um, although it spins, but it stays on the road. And Mr. McCombs' vehicle actually goes into the ditch and it ends up in flames. 
Um, so the bystanders actually pull him out of the vehicle. Pull Mr. McCombs out of the vehicle. Out of the vehicle, correct. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And uh, go ahead. So they no, pull him out ahead. out of the vehicle. He goes to the hospital. We we know for at least from um, the aspect of of uh, the discussions um, that he <clears throat> only stays there about a day. Right? Yeah, I think they actually. Um, you know how they black it out and then put some wordings? I think yeah. in the actual wording they say he was released the same day. The same day. So this, he wasn't yeah. even there. He wasn't there a the full day. He was no. released the same day. Mr. Yeah. McCombs. All right. Um, but when you see the vehicles, I, I think I, I, I just want to mention this. I, I Even though I do not like the episode because I feel like there was a lot of things about the episode that just sucked. Okay. Mm-hmm. From an aspect of trying to tell a documentary perspective, um, but putting aside, I do think this is something that individuals should look at to understand how you can be um, doing your regular day's activities and be caught up in something. Mm-hmm. Um, because here you're just driving, right? And you can be caught up as a victim um, on the receiving end of being hit. Or you could be involved in a collision where you're trying to figure out what happened, but then someone has been charged with a crime as a result of that accident, right? Right. Um, so it, it's important to do that, to look at that, I think, from that perspective. And let's just mention on this highway, there is no obstruction. There is no mm-hmm. median. This is a one, two, two lanes, one going east, one going west, um, and there are double lines um, right. there, right? Um, and so there's no passing lane or anything like that, at least in the portions um, where the crime scene occurred. Right. All right. So we we hear Mr. McCombs lawyer tell him the four ways in which he can be charged. OK. Um, for manslaughter, at least under Texas law, recklessly caused the death of an individual um, basically is what the manslaughter charges as a legend. He was inattentive inattentive mr mccombs uh, these are the allegations Mm -hmm. and he caused the accident and four ways in which they can prove that he can they can show this and they've been a prosecution because they have the burden to prove can show that he failed to drive a single lane meaning he failed to stay in his lane and he somehow crossed the double line which is what denise said at the very beginning he drove a car into the lane of the other which is essentially the same thing right without the aspect of being inattentive. He failed to keep proper lookout. That means while he was driving, some for some reason, whether he spaced out, whether he was on his cell phone, whether he was talking to someone, whether he was trying to turn the channel, where he was trying to eat his McDonald's um, or Wendy's. We don't know if that's in there, but Wendy's McDonald's, if y'all listening, y'all want to sponsor brother, go ahead and help us out. Oh, okay, McDonald's should, especially since our child works Especially there. if McDonald's, if you're going to go ahead and try to get that veggie burger, that means I have more opportunities to eat there. All right, moving on then the fourth way is he failed to keep control of the vehicle right right so basically he was con- as a as the driver it's your responsibility to maintain control of that vehicle and there are mechanical aspects of a vehicle that maybe you can't control but you are the operator of that vehicle and so you need to maintain control of that all right so those are the four ways that we go there the lawyer is trying to figure out what happened he asked mr mccombs what happens um, prior to the accident, um, Mr. McComb simply doesn't remember, right? Right. Uh, but I think it's it's important to mention what he tells him after he discusses the four ways, you know, that they can prove. He he tells them what the counts, what each count is, and what right. each count can be punishable. And, for. and and what is that? So I'm not. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but I think he says each count has a punishable punish what's punishable the word? offense. Of pro- probation up to two to ten years in jail or mm-hmm. two to twenty years in prison. Correct. No. Um, and I think he does use each offense. And so remember, he's been yeah. charged with, even though he's been charged with three different offenses. Okay. So each each one comes with a price tag. I'm using the word price tag, right? Of one of those two things. You either can get probation for two to two two to ten years. Um, which basically means you don't serve any jail time, but you'd be on probation, right? You have to go through some kind of monitoring, whatever the court system establishes, or you can go to jail prison for two to 20 years. Okay. I use the word jail, but technically prison, because remember jails, if you remember from one of our previous episodes, I talked about the difference between prison and jail. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you remember that, Denise? My child does, but I don't. 
<laughs> All right. So for jail, there is a limit in, in which um, how how long you can reside there, <laughs> stay in there. Is it a year? It's t- typically a year. Um, I under a year. Now. Um, I use I like to use the word three hundred and sixty four days because once you get to three hundred and sixty five days, you are technically a year. Some places, some folks like to use a a year in one day. Um, so but after that, you that's what prisons are for. Okay. Um, pri- uh, jails are also used as housing units sometimes where folks are being transferred from one prison to another or as they await trial for whatever reason they're waiting in jail. Okay, putting that aside. And if you want more information, watch 60 Days In also through A&E. A&E should sponsor us. With I all know, this. but you, I don't know why you're giving them this free show. I know. <laughs> Damn, we talking A&E, about in case you're listening because of the hashtags. You should oh, yeah. sponsor us. So, what type of evidence do does the prosecution show Denise or present to the defense about why Mr. Um, McCombs um, should be charged with manslaughter and two counts of aggravated um, assault with a deadly weapon? So, one of the evidence that they have is that they, after they, I guess when he went to um, the hospital, they took his blood and stuff, and he has morphine in his blood. Correct. So there's levels of morphine in, in the system. And we'll talk about what that means and what they find out through that. So we find that out. And then what else is the the ac- accusations or evidence that the prosecution contends um, satisfies as to why Mr. Roland, excuse me, why Mr. McComb should be charged with manslaughter? The allegation Look of. That Look, good. Look at that shirt. Look at that that's not a shirt. That's a hoodie. Oh, hoodie. Um, the second evidence is the allegation of text messages that Mr. McCombs was had text messaged someone okay. prior to the accident. Right. So we have and we know that um, <clears throat> this is something that's commonplace. People are always on the go, go, go. They're working. They're connected to their work. They're connected to the family. Folks sending messages. What's for dinner? What time you coming home? Why are you on that road? I see your location. You shouldn't be there. What you doing there? Who you going to see? Where your hoe at? Those type of things. Like oh you- my God! Who are you involved <laughs> with? <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, you got all these things coming at you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And oftentimes we are moving. We're always moving. It's like a constant, constant state of there. movement yeah. on the go. Go, 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 go. Right. And so. You know, you pick up the phone, you look at it really quickly and you send a message and you go. Right. And so the allegation is, is that Mr. Um, McCones was inattentive and on his phone mm-hmm. sending text messages. And as a result of that, um, it resulted in Mr. Rollins, the the senior, excuse me, Mr. Greaves, the Roland Greaves, the senior, the 80 year old, um, losing his life and his son um, being severely injured as a result of this. Right. Mm-hmm. But I guess we should mention that the allegation starts because I guess when the police comes to talk to him in the hospital, mm-hmm. um, he it, it, he mentions that he could have been texting. Right. So there's no they don't have text message communications. Right. right? Um, and I don't think and if my memory serves me correctly, there is no evidence of that whatsoever. No, been brought not at that all. There's full text mes- message conversation. Right. Um, and I think when we were discussing this briefly offline, one of the things or the, the the things that people should 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 think about also is that, um, you know, <clears throat> back in the day, yes, you 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 could subpoena the phone carriers, get full records of the actual text communications. But a lot of times nowadays, because a lot of these communications are encrypted. You don't have that. And the reason that's important is that the provider, first of all, um, in a civil case, you typically cannot um, subpoena. You can, but you more likely than not are going to be denied access to that information. So a civil case is when you are suing someone um, for some action and you're seeking some kind of redress, typically through some kind of money damages or something like that. Criminal, there is an exception to the federal statute relating to telecommunications that allow individuals to suit to subpoena um, phone carriers for evidence relating to that cell phone usage, whether it's phone calls, whether it's text messages and all of that. But I say all that to say that a lot of these programs people are using like WhatsApp. WhatsApp is, is an encryption to encryption, meaning that the third party, that is the phone carrier or the provider of that service, 
cannot have access and do not see those telephone messages. One thing that Apple does, and which is with the iMessaging, um, which there was a lot of slack for them, is that they those iMessage iMessage communication with the the messages are blue and blue. Um, they are um, encrypted as well, meaning Apple doesn't have access to that. So you have to think about those things too. So I don't know if that was the case here or not. We don't get all of that. But I think it's important because the episode does a shitty job of describing these things. It's important for the, the listeners to recognize some of those things, um, those nuances when it relates to what happened in the case that matters. I so think. that's very interesting because I remember us having this conversation offline and discussing that, right? But then yesterday I was binge watching um, the first 48. And so it came, you know, it, it came back to my mind because they were. They were calling, and this wasn't a subpoena unless that happened behind the scenes, but they were calling the phone companies, and, and this is two different episodes. They were calling the phone companies to request the text messages be, you know, for that phone line, and they received it, and it would have the actual conversation. Yeah, but be more likely than not, first of all, the first 48, let's be clear, okay? <laughs> Most of those folks that they doing that with, they got flip phones. They got these old regular little phones. Okay. A. Well, actually, this is the, the it what couldn't I was have been an iPhone. It couldn't. It, it Well, let me make it clear. It could have been. First an of iPhone. all, you 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 interrupted me. You well, didn't even let me finish. This is this happened in 20. Um, this is the whole season of 2020. So it's it's fairly recent. And the two case, I will say, were not iPhones. They were actually Samsung because they had to power them up because the phones had died. Um, and so they have this device that they use to be able to power the phone while at the same time sending all the information from that phone to that little device to go into their computer. So that's how they were trying to. Okay, so but let me just let me just jump in. That's different because that is doing I'm going to use the word forensic. But that's doing a forensic examination of the device. So remember, oftentimes I, 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 we're kind of going off topic, but I'm. Well, I, no, because I, I, had, let me finish. Let me finish. Well, 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 wait. So if that if that officer would have the officer that went to McCombs hospital room, mm -hmm. had he asked him for the cell phone at the time, could he have done that? Well, first of all, yeah, I, I, I think there is. Um, I think there would have been justification from a from a standpoint that there was an exigent circumstance that required him to um, receive access and maintain potential evidence. So had the officer, well, first of all, the officer, it, <clears throat> let me just say this. Uh, if I was a prosecutor, right, the first thing I'm telling my officers are, is not you did a are. shitty job <laughs> no is when you are investigating issues and you are communicating with potential witnesses or potential victims or or victims or potential um uh, folks who are accused right mm -hmm. criminals when you ask them questions and they freely give that information the first thing you want to do is ask well do you have the device and if they say yes you want to say can i get the device then you want to ask them are you okay with me Going, going into this device. Mm -hmm. Do you have the passcode? Can I get the passcode? Now, folks will more likely than not do that and say, yeah, go ahead. I don't have nothing to hide, blah, 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 whatever. If that's the case, yes. Now, even if the person says, no, I don't want you to see it, that doesn't mean that I can't confiscate this, the potential evidence, right? Because if there is a, a, a scene of a crime, there is a crime, and this is potential evidence, I can confiscate that. I would then need to go it depends on the year, right? Because there was a recent Supreme Court case, I think it was in 2017, 2016, 2018, somewhere between there, that basically says this. Look, cell phones are so important. They're entwined into our everyday life that they are, they are the same thing as your personal files now, right? So in order for you to go in the person's cell phone and access that cell phone, you need to have a subpoena or, excuse me, a warrant from a federal judge or a state judge that says that there is justification and reason to go into that cell phone, right? Now, one way you get around going through all that process is you ask the person for permission, 
And so mm -hmm. if the person says, yes, I want to do this, I want to get into that, boom, 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 then you you can you free go in there and do what you want, right? But to answer your question, yes, the cop or the officer, when when Mr. McCombs said I could have been texting or I could have been calling, I, hello, where's the cell phone? Do you have it on you? Yeah. Can I have it? I need it, dude. Can I open it so I can see what was going on? Be, because in Mr. McCombs' head, you have to think about it. In Mr. McCombs' head, He's not thinking that I killed someone. Right. right? He, He's thinking it's an accident. We don't even know if he killed. We don't right. even know if he knew someone he had knew, died. Right. right. He knew it was an accident, I'm assuming. But that's what he's thinking. It's an accident. So let me try to help as much as possible because I don't right. want, I mean, in my head, I'm thinking I want my insurance to go up. So let me. <laughs> ah! Jesus. Let me. Let me. You, you, but you see how these are things that, that, that people on the fly of something, you're yeah. thinking about. You're not thinking about the, the end result, right? Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead. We're off topic. Continue. Um, so, yeah, so those that's the evidence they have, the morphine in his blood and the allegation of text messages based on the conversation that he had with the police officer who went to the hospital when he went, you know, when they took him to the hospital. Right. And so as we one thing that we talked about, Denise and I first began, we, I think we both gave kudos to the off, um, the defense attorney because mm -hmm. he actually went and investigated the scene. He went to go look at it. Um, and I guess we should. I, I mean, I don't know if it matters. I mean, if you want to say something about the father, I'm not sure it's relevant to the case. But if you want to say something about Mr. McCombs father, go ahead. Well, I only felt it was um, relevant after I heard the um, the verdict, right? Mm -hmm. Because before we even go to the verdict, the mother, you know, comes out and she says that his father served in the um, police department for 28 years in San Antonio. So she does mention that when the accident occurred, the father had gone to the scene and he had tried to... Um, I wouldn't say recreate, but he, he looked at ev all the evidence that they had. And he says at that time that it was going to be very difficult for them to prove who was guilty. Mm -hmm. It was going to you know be a hard time determining was it the Graves or was it his son? Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, the father um, had a brain tumor and they it was an, an inoper inoperable mm -hmm. brain tumor. So... There was not much that he could try to do right now to be there to support the son. I mean, he was there to support him, but to give him advice or anything because of the condition he was in. So yeah. I only felt it was relevant based on what she said that he said when he went to the crime. Yeah. You know, to the scene. I mean, I, yeah, I get that. I appreciate you doing that. That was very nice of you and benevolent of you. Can you give okay. So I get all that. But I guess for me, at the end of the day, yes, he was an officer. But what we don't know is whether he was a whether he worked in um, accident recreation, um, whether that was his job or not. I mean, the bottom line is he's his father. Of course, he wants mm -hmm. his son Definitely, yeah. to be innocent. I mean, I, I think that is a bias that you automatically um, uh, that you automatically assume. And maybe he isn't that type of person or not. But I get it. it to me, I felt like A&E, it was a sympathy um, string been pulled because I don't think it had any relevance to the case because we didn't hear that same like we didn't I, I guess what frustrated me about that is yes I, I don't want anyone to have to experience the potential or the inevitability of someone dying that you love right mm -hmm. um, but we didn't get that with the with Mr. Roland Greaves who died. We didn't get that with the son who was in the hospital. Now, granted, at least as A&E presented it, they said that the family didn't want anyone to know about the state of the son. But again, that's A&E's perspective. I don't know if that's true or not. And so I just felt like it was just, it was just a, a, a space filler that didn't need to be there in the episode. Sorry. Yeah. I, I know I could be heartless, but whatever. All right. So <clears throat> with the morphine, we find out that um, that Mr. Uh, McCombs had consumed um, morphine or some pills for morphine for his back the day before. Mm -hmm. So basically he was saying, it's like that was the night before, like they had nothing to do with it now. 
and I think one thing that is important is that the lawyer basically said, well, none of that matters. Right? Like at the end of the day, whether it was right. the day before, whether it was three weeks before, it's in your system. And so at that point, um, the question becomes whether or not that amount can impair your ability physically or mentally for driving that vehicle. And if it can, then that's more evidence to substantiate the fact that you should not have been driving and more likely than not, you caused the accident, right? Right. Um, and so I... I do you I, want to tell them the amount that they found? Yeah, it was like point zero point one zero one yeah. percent. Now, for me, I'm not. I didn't. I didn't like science. Okay, I did good in school because I had to. Okay, um, but I didn't like science, and ultimately, I got a bachelor's in science and criminal justice, and that meant I had to take more science. But let me just quickly tell you why. Because let me just say, okay, oh, I took Swahili, I took Swahili, okay, in undergrad. I'm um, excuse me, in high school, that was my foreign language. I didn't take Spanish and French and all that like everybody else. Okay, I took Swahili. I was good in it. I got all, I got A's on it. Right. I was very high up in my class in the Swahili class that I partake in, uh, partook in, and and I went to undergrad. And they were like, "Well, you need to take foreign language." And I was like, "No, I'm not gonna take a foreign language. Like, I want to test out." I took Swahili. Like, give me. <laughs> Swahili, okay, like, what are you doing? It was like, no, we don't have a Swahili. And I was like, excuse me, this is this was in like 2004, 2005. And I'm like, that ain't my problem. That's your problem. Like, there are more languages in the world than Spanish and French. And there's no shame, no tea, no nothing to that. But it's like, bitch, that ain't my problem, okay? <laughs> Find me a fucking person who can test me out of Swahili. Um, and I got so pissed and this was my way of, um, protest. And I was Did like, Did they you know, find someone? No. And I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to take, I'm not taking another, I'm not taking foreign language at this university. I'm not paying you to teach me a language that I don't fucking care about learning at this time because I took Swahili. That's what I cared about. So I was like, nah, I'm out. Bye. Peace. And I switched my major to, well, I switched my degree from a bachelor of arts to a bachelor of science and I had to take more science as a result of that. And I decided to go to our local community college and take Spanish as protest. Wow. Boom. All right, moving on. Okay. So I always have Yeah, I'm, like I'm over here thinking like, okay, maybe What's he's that to about do with the case? Yeah, like maybe I'm thinking like maybe he's about to say science because of the morphine. <laughs> like <laughs> it'd be stand up for you. Stand up for what you believe in at any point of the day, at any point in time. You never know where your your resistance is important. All right. So moving going on. Going back to the case. <laughs> we we'll go back to the case. Okay. So we go back to the case, point zero one. We don't know what that means, really. I, I don't. I'm not a scientist. I don't know what it means. But what, what it does seem to suggest right. is that it's not enough to impair Mr. McCombs. He's a big guy. I, I, he wasn't that big. I mean, he ain't skinny. Yeah, but I mean, when you say big guy, I'm, 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 in my head, I'm thinking of the 1,000-pound sister brother. Mm-mm, mm-mm. That ain't big. That's fat. No offense, <laughs> no shade, no tea. That's one of my favorite um, shows on TLC. <laughs> my sister, Japan Life, and um, Thousand Pound Sister. We'll talk about that because we're going to do an episode on that, I think. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, but he, 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 he was bigger. Okay, he's bigger than me. I mean, uh, everyone is bigger than you because you're skinny. No, I'm not. I'm overweight, but he's bigger than me. Oh, my okay? God. Oh, my God. Um, okay, again, this has nothing to do with the gays. But but at the end of the day, you have to think about you. At that point, you have to think about, okay, who are you going to present to show that 0.01% was enough to impair him? So that goes into the battle of the experts. The, from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. that's what you're going to do. It. Setting up the defense, you want to bring someone in who's going to be able to talk about what that means, that this person weighs, this person is this tall, he weighs this much, he has this ability to, um, he doesn't have a resistance to medication um, and things of that nature. So you, you have to go into all that and think about that from a defense mechanism. Okay, so we don't get all of that. We just know that the prosecution is saying that there's morphine. But from a jury perspective, right, you think about that. Think about someone, a a lay person sitting in the jury and they hear, oh, morphine. Mm, I can't just go to the store and get morphine, right? I, that right. has to be prescribed. Like either he's abusing drugs or he was taking something and he shouldn't have been driving. And he know that he knew at the time that he took that, that there was a warning sign that it could impair you if you are operating a vehicle or some other kind of motor um device whatever right so you have to think about how other people who are viewing the case are going to think about it. 
right? They're going to perceive that you exactly. had the morphine and what Exactly. All right. And then what we find out towards the end of the case, right, is that his cell phone survives the fire in the car. Yes. Right? Now, and, before before we say that, let's talk about the fact that he claims that oh, he, he pulled actually, over. right, that he pulled <laughs> over go ahead, go ahead. and he he texted and then got back on the road. So he remembers that. He doesn't remember nothing else, but he does remember the possibility of Which pulling over. Which is why over, I said I don't really believe it. Then he says, okay, go ahead. Texting and then getting back on, on the road. And is, I mean. Is it texted or text? He sent a text or he texted. A text it. because they mentioned that. No, no. I'm asking you grammatically which one is accurate. We need to do some research. I have no that. idea. All right. Go ahead. But they do say that um, they do mention because he was um, an executive director for a health company. And he got fired. He got fired. So now <laughs> he has to he had to end up working as a contractor for a roofing company to be able to support himself and the six kids that they have together. Mm-hmm. Um, but he they do mention that. He does remember that the message came from someone that he works with, mm-hmm. and that's who he thinks he had texted back. That he actually pulled over and texted that person. Right. Okay. But let's let's fast forward this because this episode was too short, and we don't need to be spending a lot of time on this episode because it was boring to me. All right, moving on. Let's fast forward that. Yes. That that is key because um, when his lawyer pulled the phone records, we don't see the text message communication. Right. But we see the numbers that's been a change, right? The lawyer gets the records and was like, okay, you said you were texting somebody, but where is this showing here? Right. Right? And so he doesn't... He There's doesn't no have record ex- of it. He has no recollection of what that is, why that's the case. But he swore up and down that he text, he pulled over and he responded to a work text and then got back on the road. But I think I mentioned to you why I believe him. And it's because... You know, I I had an accident when I was between 18 and 19 years old, and it was it, it was a car accident, and I was unconscious, and I don't remember anything. I don't remember how the accident happened. I don't remember what happened while I was at the hospital. I do remember moments prior to the accident, prior to us actually getting in the vehicle, and I remember snippets of waking up in the hospital after the accident so i can say that i do believe that there are certain things that he doesn't remember and the the text message situation could have been something that was on his mind and that's why he mentions it because i also mentioned to you how apparently because again i don't remember but i was told by those that were with me do throughout the entire time i was unconscious i kept asking for my ex-boyfriend you know i kept wanting to know how was he why he had cheated on me why he had left me so that could have been something that happened to him you know he he doesn't remember the accident but he remembers snips of stuff that may have occurred prior to it so i kind of do believe him when he mentions that when he says that you know he he could have i don't believe that he pulled over but I do believe that he may have answered to that text message only because it's something that he remembers. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. This is why when you are in situations with um, your attorneys uh, that are in the criminal justice system, you have to get ready for a jury trial. These are the type of questions you want to make sure that you try to get the, to ask the jury. Like, as she, let me tell you, okay, <laughs> she'd be one of the first people I struck. From the jury, she got to go. Okay, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't I, have listen, mentioned this. I don't want her on my jury panel whatsoever. Okay, I want her gone. Okay. Well, listen, I don't think he would have wanted me on his panel either because when you were going over the four counts, I marked. I would have found him guilty three see, out of those four. And you ain't, so, even, you ain't even you ain't even see no evidence yet. Nah. Yeah, I want you gone. See, that's why <laughs> this, that, that, that that is the the fickleness of juries. Like you. You you think it's all yep. about the evidence? It's not. It's about personal experience. Oh, mm-hmm. I would have done this if I was in this person's shoes. So I would have behaved. Oh, I don't like the way her shoes look today. She yeah. should have wore a better outfit. And she is the she's the uh, the accused. She's the defendant. And she come up in here rolling her eyes. That you know. Now you're going back to angels, okay? I'm just saying, <laughs> like these are things that it's true. It's it, true. It, from personal experience, you 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 have to 
think about mm-hmm. the fact that it's not going to always be about the evidence that's presented mm-hmm. before the jury. It's about nope. all these other unspoken things that matters. And so it's going to be important, I think, when you are involved in these situations and particularly when you have a lawyer who can represent your interests, that you need a lawyer who's going to represent that interest and make sure that they try to impanel a jury that's going to be fair and equitable. That's not mm-hmm. to say that they that they have all the power within the world to do that but there are certain mechanisms mechanisms available to lawyers that allow them to do that and so you want to you you this isn't legal advice this is just common sense okay you want to ask your attorney okay what do you when we get to the point we're going to trial okay so what are we doing about the jury what type of person are we doing we want on here have we have we talked to anyone who has experience in jury pooling and in jury and paneling what are they suggesting x y and z now that's not to say that the shit is free right right <laughs> but these are questions that you want to ask um so that you can make sure that the folks who are representing your interest whether it's civil or criminal understand the process and understand you and they have a sense that you understand the process that's just my opinion All right. and a, a perfect book to to you know go read that a will help you understand things. that yep small great things by mm-hmm. jody picolt yep we we did that in our our book our book club it's mm-hmm. amazing how we read stuff we do these things we talk about them on a podcast and how it really resonates ties. and matter yeah, yeah ties in and we don't even plan these things this is the no. beauty of um podcasting which i really 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 enjoy all right moving on so we go through all this right and we find out we get to the trial date right but before we get to trial date the prosecution calls in mr mccombs said they want to offer a plea deal we already talked about this on other episodes so you should know what those mean go back and listen to some of those episodes if you don't um and so one of the plea deals that are provided that's provided to mr mccombs which we don't really know what the full extent of it but we know that everything that the prosecution offered included some kind of jail time right and mr mccombs and his attorney were adverse against any time in jail right Right. their perspective at least as presented through a and e was that this was the accident and the accident is just that it was not intentional and is not criminal right yeah and i i think i want to go back to what you said about this lawyer right he went to the crime scene and i think because we were not allowed to go inside the courtroom to see right. what actually happened. Right. We're we just... don't know what evidence was presented in the court. We don't know right. who was said, who said what. Yes, go ahead. But there are certain things that he mentions while he's at the crime scene that I'm assuming, the niece is assuming, he presented as evidence. Should be on my jury, right. but go ahead. Which is why, honestly, guys, I shouldn't even be a lawyer because I would be... <laughs> <laughs> such a bad lawyer but anywho no i don't think so i think you you'll be amazed at what you're I, you'll be amazed at what you would bring to the legal profession if you actually put your mind to it and did it so don't say that but go ahead so true so true anywho so he you know when he goes to the scene he talks about how it's a sharp curve where the accident occurred right and so it's 70 miles per hour both ways mm-hmm. so because it's a head-on collision and that you can't means see you can't see and as you're doing this curve. Mm-hmm. That means that if both of them are actually doing the speed limit, that was a a, a impact of 140 miles, mm-hmm. right? Because they're both going 70. Um, so there was not a lot, uh, not, a, mm, not a lot of time for Mr. McCombs to regain control of the vehicle if that impact was 140 miles, you know, of a hit. And assuming that he lost control at any point of time before the right. accident. Okay, because right. again, one of the things that the father just goes to Denise point of of the father, one of the things that he um, indicated when he went to the crime scene before he was diagnosed with um, an operable tumor, tumor. Um, is that his his opinion was that it's going to be difficult to determine who crossed where because mm-hmm. there were skid marks on both sides, which indicates that at some point both cars cars cross the yellow line. Right. Right. Who crossed when, who caused which one to cross is a question of fact that the jury will have to decide when it gets to the jury. But go ahead. No. And that that was that's what I wrote down that stood out to me. Right. The fact that we couldn't hear what happened inside because they don't allow us to go in. And I say us because I'm watching it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the the which pissed me off. Like there are so many. I mean, we can't we can't have it all. We just can't have it. No, all. No, there are so many other issues. I mean, you think about like this was what this 
last year that they were filming this or the year before 29 there were so many issues going on there were so many issues in the black community yeah. and and underserved underprivileged communities that this this documentary could really highlight um what was going on and how the legal system works for individuals and i just felt like this was a waste like you should have cleared this with the court you should have known that this was going to be an issue like i don't know maybe it's the state of texas i, I wouldn't doubt that it's the state of texas uh i don't care if it was the state of texas or not first of all y'all should get rid of tech Cruz. okay <laughs> Vote him out, gay, okay, because he, I, I don't care if you're Republican or not, he don't represent your interests, he represents himself, and that's all he cares about, okay, get him out, okay, get somebody else, and if you want another Republican there, go ahead and get another Republican there, but get Ted Cruz out, because first of all, he an idiot, he don't, he don't know his left from his right, okay, he can say whatever he wants to say in regards to that, moving on, but I just felt like there was so, this was a teaching moment mm -hmm. of the criminal justice system, of how it works, of the things that that folks have to think about and for us to not be able to go into the courtroom and see what happens mm -hmm. like <sighs> but it could it could maybe it was a request from the family too because the family could it could could it have been a request from i don't care maybe it could have what i'm saying is i don't care the case would go on whether or not a e is present what i'm saying is a e wasted an hour of my life on a case where I can't go inside and see what the freak happened in the courtroom you know, is Dr. what I'm saying. Dr. Phil says that all the time. That's an hour of my life I can't get back. I cannot. Like, <laughs> you know, put that in the description. Hey, we can't get into the courtroom. I would have skipped it and be like, hey, y'all, I know okay. we said we were going to do all the episodes. That's exactly why they won't do it because then you won't watch the episode. We ain't doing this. We're going to skip this one. Go ahead. Well, listen, I don't think I can do seven or eight because those, they were we, so boring. We got to do them whether we do them together or not. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right. So now, and I haven't even looked at them yet. Okay. So now we, we get to the point they deny they being Mac the McComb and his defense says, nah, thank you, prosecution. Say that for another day. We're not mm -hmm. accepting that plea deal. Nope. They go to trial. As Denise already indicated. We we don't know what's going on in there, right? All we see is the door open. We see them go in. We see the door close. Okay. We yes. see lunch break. We see the door open. We see them come out. Okay. We see lunch over. We see the door oh open. God. Just we get see to them the go point. In and the door close. That's it. I just want you to know. That's all we see. Okay. We don't know what kind of evidence was presented. We don't know how the styles were presented. Whatever. All right. We go through all that. Um, and so. We hear at one point the uh, M Mr. McCombs attorney say, and I liked him. I, I, I'm I going too. to say I really liked him. OK, now I know he was, you know, whatever. Um, he indicated that the last the last person that the prosecution put on was Mr. Um, Greaves wife, the widow. And her testimony was so riveting, emotional, and um, gravitating, right, that he, that the defense determined at the time that they was going to put on the stand Mr. McCombs. Right, because they were not planning on doing that until not. the prosecution. As most, as most criminal defense lawyers will recommend against going on the stand because there's a lot of issues that goes with that, right? Once you understand, you open yourself up. Right. Okay, you open yourself up. You go up there talking about I ain't never cursed, and then they pull up somebody who says, "Oh, but you said shit in church on Tuesday, right?" Yeah. So you're a liar. Okay, so you already deemed a liar, and now you're trying to have a jury of your peers say they agree with you. Yeah, no, not going to happen. So most most lawyers don't want that to happen for their um, criminal defendants. So that's you know there's there's issues there. But I thought this was a great strategic decision mm -hmm. to separate um the last heart pulling testimony from the widow who lost her husband and now has to deal with a son i'm assuming it's her son who's in a vegetative state mm -hmm. right that's what the jury hears it's emotional I mean, yeah there's no nothing i can say against that right it's emotional and so i can see why that that strategic decision was made to say Hey, 
let's go on and put Mr. McCombs on there so we could put some distance from that emotional aspect and bring on um and, and, and then bring on Mr. McCombs so we can put some emotional some distance from that emotional testimony from the wife. Did you what do you think about that? I agree. I don't see it as, as you know, you, as a lawyer, I'm sure that's why you use those words, but I see it as they got that emotion from her. Let me show the emotion from him as well. You know yeah. what he's going through, what he yeah. has to experience, because, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, this person lost his life. His son has ended up being in this state, but this person also went through it as well. And there has been consequences based on this accident that this person now has to face or has gone through. So if you want to see the emotions from this family, look at the emotions from this person, too. Yeah. And, and I think that was a very good point that you made, because I, I just want to say this and I, I, I wrote it down, but I'm not sure I would have said it tonight had you not mentioned this, is that um, the criminal justice system is not should not be about emotion. Right. It should be about what the law says um, and how individuals either um, violate that or not. Right. Mm -hmm. But too often we as individuals, we get enwrapped into the emotional standpoint. And part of I think what this one thing about the documentary, I think, was successful in doing is showing how maybe potentially the state was wrapped up in his own emotion that someone died right there's someone in a vegetative state and as a result of that we want someone to pay because of that and it's just un unfortunately sometimes there are freak accidents that we can't control mm -hmm. no matter how we think about it no matter how we try to um put it in our heads and try to figure out the psychological standpoint that goes with it we just can't prove it, right? And we can't show that it is just a freak accident. And so we want someone to pay. Someone has to pay. Someone did this, and as a result, someone needs to suffer. Um, and so I wonder, um, is this something that maybe a and &E, and I just realized sitting here today talking to you, that maybe that was one of the points of showing the documentary, because other than that, it sucked. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, if you think this one sucked, seven and eight are going to drive you crazy. All right. So at the end of the day, we don't see anything that goes in trial, but then we come out and we see, we don't immediately hear the verdict. No. All we see is Mr. McCombs hugging his lawyer. Right. We pan in video hugging and I'm thinking, OK, well, if he's if he's guilty, he ain't hugging him. He's he been locked up. Well, it's, honestly, I I for a second, I was like. Oh, yeah. shucks. Like, they found him guilty. <laughs> they duped you, bamboozled you. They did you an okie doke. Mm -mm. They sure did. Yeah, no. Um, so he was ultimately, the jury ultimately found him not guilty. Mm -hmm. um, in, in unanimous verdict. Yep. Yep, unanimous verdict, uh, not guilty. Um, so, yeah, that was that particular case. And I know we probably went on longer than we anticipated because there was a lot of in-between in there. But that was that case. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's good to mention and bring to light that do not text and, and, and drive. Do right? not. If you can the, let your you can, do hands-free. If, yep. your, if your car talk to you when you get a text message, use that feature. Well, well, that may not be, you know, because you don't know who you have in the car and you may get that text message saying, I want some booty tonight and you don't that want nobody to hear that. Hey. So, that, hey. That, hey, if that's I'm your advice. I'm <laughs> responding. What time? What's going on? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I would too. But with my kids in the car, I can't be getting that type of text what, message. What, you know what, what I mean? What are we talking about? Where are we going? <laughs> what time? Like, who paying? No, seriously. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But it, I mean, I have it on my car and it, it comes up now. I took the sound off, not because I was concerned about that, because I really don't care. But I'm concerned. Well, I, I, I have minors. Me too. I have a. Oh God, that 16 year old knows more than you come on now i mean but we to our credit we have open communication i talk to him about this stuff all the time yeah. moving on but i didn't like the fact that my car dinged every time a text you had a message came. yeah and so it irritated me i mean you already know how i, I get irritated very quickly mm -hmm. um and so i took that off but i it comes up on the car and you know i'll hit the button and it reads it out and i reply and move forward well, um, i don't i don't even do that i have mine 
on when do not I had, disturb. Yep, I had that, my that iPhone. That is annoying. But you don't have an iPhone anymore. But I still have this one the same way. Yeah. So we'll I have it where I go. don't I just don't like it because it's like like I don't know if this is what motivates you, right? But the fact that I know that there's a message in there and it's already telling me what the message is is going to want me to want it's going to make me want to reply. So to avoid all of that, I try to listen, it can wait. It's not it's not an emergency. If it's an emergency, you wouldn't be texting and you will be calling me. So no. Well, because I don't like to receive phone calls. I normally hit decline. But see, people like people that know me know that if it's an emergency, call me. Do not text me. Yeah, but I'm not gonna call you. I'm gonna text you. Well, then you won't get. Don't don't treat me as your emergency person because then you're gonna be dead. Then I need to remove you. Yes, please do. Um, but no, but that's my advice. You know, don't text and drive. Um, think of not just just yourself think of the other people that may be involved yeah. because it could be impacting them as well you know a life can be lost and a lot of things can be lost so yeah. just be mindful of those things there's time for you to be able to whenever you get to where you're going to stop and reply to that message so that's right all right so we appreciate you denise for that that is great advice i have nothing to add to that i think you did that um Oh, and wear your seatbelts because seat I was belt. not wearing my seatbelt, which is why I got into the accident. Well, I, I'm not going to put your business out there. I, I don't think you really still like wearing seatbelts, but putting that aside. I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that is the episode, episode 34, episode Deadly. What, what was it called? Let me go back to it because I forgot what it was called. Deadly. Uh, deadly. Dad, deadly driver, driver or tragic accident. accident. That was on the menu today, episode 34. Um, continue to make sure that when you um, look us up, you listen to us on the whatever your favorite podcast directory is, um, that you have some kind of drink in your hand if you can. If you can't, that's perfectly fine. Have one that is in spirit. We are here with you. And when I say drink, it is alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Alcoholic if you are over the age of 21. Um, check us out on Facebook. Facebook is at Peeps Creek Cafe. Um, I put it up here on the screen for those of you who are looking. Um, you can hit us up on YouTube at um, www.youtube.com backslash Peeps Creek Podcast um, where you can see us in action um, physically. Um, yeah. And then we are on um, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok Peeps Creek. Um, hit us up. Slide into our DMs. Talk to us. You can send us a text message at 202-618-0043. We will respond. Um, send us an email at cafe at peachcreek.com. Um, and make sure you visit our website. Sign up for our um, newsletter once a month. Um, we'll hit you up with some inspirational stuff and some, some nice little things going on. Um, and we should be having a raffle. Not even a raffle, actually. It's a giveaway soon. Um, with some books that we think are going to be good for um, Black History Month, um, which we all know is in February. And while we are on here, we would be remiss if we did not um, take a moment of silence um, to celebrate the life, the legacy, the power of Cicely Tyson, who passed away on yesterday. We are recording this on the 29th, but she passed away on the 20. Hey, right? Mm -hmm. Thursday. Um, so rest her soul. God rest her soul. 96 years old. If you don't know who she is, you need to go and look at her um, legacy that she left behind. Um, she was strong. She was powerful. And what I really appreciated about her is that she took a life um, vow to use her her um, power as an actress to highlight, to um to put forth, to present um, black history and black excellence and black power. Um, and so at every time that you have an opportunity to use that, I suggest that you do so, particularly mm -hmm. as a black male who did not grow up um, having those two, those abilities before him. Um, and so I hope with this podcast that I'm able to show that your voice matters. Um, your presentation matters and that you as an individual, you don't have to be a superstar, um, but you add credence, you add value, you add worth. 
to every conversation that's happened in this world. So, yeah. Yes, agree. All right. So that is the episode. Denise, I appreciate you taking your time with us today. Say bye to the people. Bye, guys. And if you want to just purchase a coffee for me, please go to our website, www.peepsgreek.com. Purchase a drink for me, a coffee, actually. You don't have to do it for Sean. He's going to be okay. Just put my name out there. And thank you. Mm. Thank <laughs> you.